Hello, this is Eric Strong from the Palo Alto Veterans Hospital and Stanford University. Today, I will be talking to you about the characteristics and identification of heart murmurs. Here are the learning objectives of this talk. First, to be able to understand the basic physiology behind the generation of murmurs. Second, to be able to describe the specific characteristics of murmurs using standardized terminology. Finally, to be able to identify the most likely underlying cardiac pathology based upon the characteristics of a heart murmur. There will be many audio clips along the way, and to assist with the last learning objective, there will be five example cases at the end where you will be asked to identify the underlying cardiac disease from an audio clip. For the purposes of this talk, I will be assuming some background knowledge in cardiovascular physiology, as well as a very basic knowledge of the common forms of valvular heart disease. I will start by spending just a minute on the physiology of murmurs. Murmurs are acoustical phenomenon produced by turbulent blood flow. They can occur in a wide variety of locations in the body and in a variety of clinical settings. When a murmur occurs outside of the heart, for example, in an abdominal aortic aneurysm, or narrowing of the carotid artery, they are usually referred to as bruies. Despite the name being different, uh, murmurs and bruies represent the same type of phenomenon. The chance that blood flow will be turbulent in any given situation, and thus produce a murmur, is dependent upon its Reynolds number, with turbulence being more likely when the Reynolds number is higher. For those of you who have not recently studied for the MCAT, the Reynolds number can be calculated from the density of the fluid times the diameter of the vessel or orifice times the velocity of flow, all divided by the viscosity of the fluid. Within the heart, the most important of these parameters are the viscosity and the velocity. And squeezing blood through a pathologically narrowed orifice will increase the velocity out of proportion to the decreased diameter. Thus, turbulent flow is most likely when either there is an increased velocity of blood through morphologically normal structures, as seen during hyperdynamic states, or as a consequence of the blood velocity being increased by compression through a narrowed structure. Alternatively, decreased blood viscosity can also result in a murmur. Let's take a quick look at the etiologies of murmurs by physiologic mechanism. First, decreased blood viscosity. The only example of this is anemia. Next, decreased diameter of a vessel, valve, or other orifice. Here we have valvular stenosis, coarctation of the aorta, and a ventricular septal defect. Then there is increased velocity of blood through normal structures, as seen in hyperdynamic states, such as sepsis and hyperthyroidism. Finally, a mechanism that I didn't previously mention is regurgitation across an incompetent valve. The turbulence caused by this is due to an abnormal morphology of the valve which sets up eddies in the flow of blood which cannot be easily accounted for by Reynolds' number. Now I will talk about the specific characteristics of murmurs. Although often the cardiac portion of a patient's physical exam may read something like, quote, systolic murmur present, such a vague statement is of little diagnostic help. Murmurs can and should instead be described based on a number of specific characteristics. They are timing, location and radiation, shape, pitch, intensity, subjective quality, and their response to specific physiologic maneuvers. Therefore, a much more helpful statement about the cardiac exam might be, quote, harsh, grade 3, early peaking, crescendo, decrescendo systolic murmur, loudest at the right upper sternal border and radiating to the carotids. Any experienced clinician hearing this description will immediately become concerned about severe aortic stenosis. A couple extra words transform a near meaningless statement into something of great diagnostic value. So let's go through what each of these characteristics mean one at a time. When one talks about the timing of a murmur, it is the timing of the murmur relative to the cardiac cycle. Specifically, is the murmur present in systole, diastole, or both? It is the single most important characteristic that will aid in the diagnosis of an associated abnormality. Systolic murmurs are by far the most common. 
They comprise greater than 95% of all murmurs that you'll hear among hospitalized patients. Etiologies include flow murmurs caused by hyperdynamic states or amnemia, aortic and pulmonic stenosis, mitral and tricuspid regurgitation, VSDs, and aortic outflow tract obstruction, which can be caused by hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. Diastolic murmurs include aortic and pulmonic regurgitation and mitral and tricuspid stenosis. Among American adults, detectable diastolic murmurs are almost always due to aortic regurgitation. Lastly, there are continuous murmurs, meaning that there are components of the murmur present in both systole and diastole. The only significant cause of this is a patent ductus arteriosus observed in infancy. Occasionally, a patient may have a systolic and separate diastolic murmur audible in the same region, leading the examiner to perceive a continuous murmur. This most commonly occurs with a combination of aortic stenosis and aortic regurgitation. The next characteristic to discuss is the murmur's location and radiation. Typically, when one mentions the location, they are more specifically referring to the location where the murmur is most easily heard. Traditionally, as can be still seen in many entry-level textbooks on the physical exam, four distinct and specific points on the chest were identified where murmurs caused by specific valves would usually be loudest. So for example, murmurs caused by a problem at the aortic valve would typically be heard loudest at the second uh, intercostal space just to the right of the sternum. Thus, this location on the chest wall was known as the aortic area. Unfortunately, in reality, the location of valve-based murmurs is not nearly so neat and specific, particularly for aortic valve murmurs, which can be heard basically anywhere in the chest. As a consequence, one should never assume the specific valvular origin of a particular murmur based solely on its location. The radiation of a murmur will seem obvious after you've heard a number of examples on actual patients, but it can be a difficult effect to clearly describe in words. It's most often described as the location where a murmur seems to travel to. However, I think of it as the location where a murmur is audible despite the stethoscope not being directly over the heart. Murmurs generally radiate in the same direction as the turbulent blood is flowing. For example, a murmur from aortic stenosis might radiate into the carotid arteries, a murmur from tricuspid regurgitation can radiate to the anterior right thorax, and a murmur from mitral regurgitation can radiate to the axilla. The shape of a murmur describes how its intensity changes from onset to completion. There are three basic shapes heard, crescendo-decrescendo, decrescendo, and uniform, also called when occurring during systole holosystolic. In general, crescendo-decrescendo and uniform murmurs are heard during systole, while decrescendo murmurs are heard during diastole. The shape of a murmur is generally determined by the pattern of the pressure gradient driving the turbulent flow, with the loudest segment occurring at the time of the greatest gradient, since this will be the point of the highest velocity. Let's look at how the pattern of the pressure gradient driving the turbulent flow determines the murmur shape. Here we have a graph of intracardiac pressures as a function of time for a single cardiac cycle. The blue line represents left ventricular pressure, the green line is aortic pressure, and the red line is left atrial pressure. As you can see, during systole, when the left ventricle contracts and its pressure increases very rapidly, there is a gradient of pressure between the LV and the aorta. That pressure gradient should not be there. Therefore, this is an example of intracardiac pressure tracings in a patient with aortic stenosis. Let's superimpose some heart sounds. Here is S1 occurring at the onset of systole and ventricular contraction, and S2 occurring at the onset of diastole and ventricular relaxation. You can see that early during systole, there is a relatively small pressure differential between the LV and the aorta. At mid-systole, the pressure gradient is much higher. Finally, towards the end of systole, as the ventricle is starting to relax and LV pressure is dropping, the pressure gradient is low again. 
Thus, we have the crescendo-decrescendo shape, which is a term borrowed from music in which a sound gradually increases in volume and then decreases in volume. Here's an example of such a crescendo-decrescendo murmur of aortic stenosis. This same analysis can be applied to every heart murmur. For example, here is aortic regurgitation. The turbulent flow here is occurring during diastole when there is a pressure gradient between the aorta in green and the left ventricle in blue. Although there is always a gradient between those two compartments during diastole, only in aortic regurgitation is there actually backwards movement of blood. As you can see, during the course of diastole, as the blood flows backwards from the aorta into the LV, the pressure in the aorta decreases, and thus the pressure gradient also decreases. This shape is known as decrescendo. Here it is again. Next, we have mitral regurgitation. The pressure gradient between the left ventricle and left atrium remains relatively constant throughout systole, resulting in a uniform or holosystolic shape. And here is mitral stenosis. Here there is a relatively constant pressure gradient between the left atrium and left ventricle, with the exception of a pre-systolic accentuation, which is the consequence of the atrial kick. The next characteristic to discuss is pitch. The pitch of a murmur is most directly related to two factors. First, high pressure gradients such as a VSD tend to produce high pitched murmurs. Second, large volumes of blood flow across low pressure gradients such as that in mitral stenosis tend to produce low pitched murmurs. In the situation such as aortic stenosis where there is both a high pressure gradient and a large volume of flow, high and low pitches are produced simultaneously. This will create a subjectively serious sounding murmur, which is frequently termed harsh. Here's an example of a high pitched murmur. Here is a low pitched one. Finally, here is a murmur that many clinicians would describe as harsh. The intensity of a murmur essentially describes how loud the volume is. The intensity of the murmur depends upon a variety of physiologic properties, such as the velocity of blood flow at its origin, and the acoustical properties of the intervening tissues. It is additionally influenced by the hearing and experience of the examiner, the stethoscope the examiner is using, and the presence of ambient noise. It is usually graded on a largely subjective scale from one to six. Grade one is barely audible. Grade two is faint, but undoubtedly present. Grade three is loud, 
grade four is associated with a palpable vibration over the involved heart valve. This is known as a thrill. Sometimes people will use the term palpable thrill, though this is redundant as thrills are palpable by definition. Grade five can be heard with only the edge of the stethoscope directly touching the chest wall. And finally, grade six can be heard without the stethoscope touching the chest wall at all. Sometimes people will joke that grade one means only the attendant can hear it, grade two means the resident can hear it, and grade three means even the medical student can pick it up. We'll see at the end of the talk that there is data suggesting this humorous characterization is without merit. This brings us to the quality of the murmur. This is the most subjective and nonspecific of the seven murmur characteristics presented here. It is essentially the difficult to describe timbre of the murmur. The murmur of mitral regurgitation is frequently described as blowing or musical. Mitral stenosis is rumbling. Aortic stenosis, as already discussed, is harsh. Aortic regurgitation is blowing. Stills murmur, which is a benign murmur typically heard only in children, is often described as musical or vibratory. And lastly, a PDA murmur, also usually heard only in children, is described as machine-like. The final murmur characteristic to discuss is the response of a murmur's intensity to specific simple physiologic maneuvers. There are many examples of this, most of which are either esoteric or with scant supportive evidence in the literature, but I will briefly go through the two which I think are the most helpful. The one that is most often helpful is asking the patient to clench their fists. Fist clenching increases afterload. This will allow the examiner to distinguish between mitral regurgitation, which should increase in intensity, and aortic stenosis, which will either decrease in intensity or be unchanged. In addition, clenching of the fists may help to bring out the murmur of aortic regurgitation. Please be aware that the changes in intensity for both this maneuver and the others can be very, very subtle. Next, one can ask the patient to either squat or quickly assume a supine position. Either of these will increase venous return, which will increase stroke volume. The consequence of this will be increased intensity of aortic stenosis versus decreased intensity for the murmur of hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. I'd like to spend just a minute mentioning two terms that I think are best avoided. First is the term ejection murmur. Technically, this refers specifically to a murmur produced by blood flowing forward through the aortic or pulmonic valves during systole. Second is the term flow murmur. This refers specifically to a murmur produced by blood flowing forward through a morphologically normal valve. The reason I don't like these terms being used in the reporting of the physical exam is because they are non-objective in the sense that in order for the examiner to use them, he or she is already implying a diagnosis. Instead, reporting of the exam should be based on observations only. I also don't like these terms because they are often misused, particularly flow murmur. It is simply not possible to state that something is definitely a flow murmur without an echocardiogram confirming the presence of structurally normal valves. At this point, I'd like to go through five example cases, each with a one-line vignette, accompanied by an audio clip. For the first case, we have a 60-year-old man with shortness of breath. This murmur is best heard with a diaphragm at the apex and is without radiations. The first step in identifying a heart murmur is to assess the timing. This can be difficult when done without the benefit of feeling a patient's pulse, but usually can be accomplished by remembering that systole is shorter than diastole, with the exception of particularly fast tachycardias. So let's listen again, specifically trying to determine whether the murmur is occurring in systole or diastole. <laughs> <laughs> 
I hope you'll agree that it is occurring during systole. Next, listen for the murmur shape. Is it uniform, crescendo decrescendo, or decrescendo? This is a uniform murmur, also known as holosystolic. Listening for shape definitely requires practice, so don't be discouraged if you can't distinguish this right away. Finally, what is the murmur's pitch? I'd label this high-pitched. So now this patient has a high-pitched uniform systolic murmur occurring at the apex. What's the most likely diagnosis? Mitral regurgitation. I also think it's important to point out what this murmur sounds like elsewhere on the chest wall. For example, here is this patient's heart as heard at the right upper sternal border. Listen to its changed intensity as well as the changed intensities of S1 and S2. and once more here at the apex. Example number two. An 80-year-old man presents with recurrent syncope. This murmur is best heard with a diaphragm at the second right intercostal space. Let's go through the same set of questions as the last case. So first, what's the timing? Systolic. Now what's the shape? Crescendo, decrescendo. Again, don't be alarmed if you find the shape difficult to identify when you're first starting out. Now what about the pitch? It's kind of hard to say what the pitch is. It has just a qualitatively unpleasant nature to it which is usually labeled harsh. Therefore, which valvular disease is likely responsible for this murmur? Aortic stenosis. Let's listen once more. For example 3, we have a 35-year-old woman who reports a history of a heart murmur and chronic exercise intolerance. This is best heard at the fourth left intercostal space. This time, listen for the timing, the shape, and the quality. Hopefully the timing for this murmur sounds different than the previous two examples. That's because this is a diastolic murmur. Its shape, decrescendo, and what about its quality? I think many people would agree that it sounds blowing in nature. Let's listen again. <laughs> 
Okay, final diagnosis. Aortic regurgitation. Once more. Example 4. A 45-year-old man from West Africa with dyspnea and lower extremity swelling for years. This murmur is loudest with the bell of the stethoscope at the apex. Timing. It's also diastolic. Shape, uniform, and pitch, low. So what would cause a uniform, low-pitched diastolic murmur at the apex? Really, only one thing can do this mitral stenosis. Why is it relevant that the patient is from West Africa? Because the most common cause of mitral stenosis by far is childhood rheumatic fever, a disease rare in the developed world of the 21st century. If you thought you heard an extra sound in early diastole and it was an S3, you're partly right. On this example, there is an extra sound there, but it's something called an opening snap which is caused by a stenotic and stiff mitral valve snapping open once pressure in the left ventricle drops below that in the left atrium. And why is it relevant that the perma is loudest with a bell? Because the stethoscope bell is better than the diaphragm for picking up low-pitched sounds. The sounds that classically fall into that category are a mitral stenosis murmur, an S3, and an S4. S3 and S4 are covered in my companion lecture on heart sounds. How will this sound with a diaphragm at the apex? Here it is. And here's the murmur once more with the bell. And here's our fifth and the last example. This is a 75 year old woman with dyspnea and exertional chest pain for several months. We'll first listen at the right upper sternal border. What's the timing here? The murmur sounds present in both systole and diastole. That is, a continuous murmur. But I have already told you that the only real continuous murmur is that of a patent ductus arteriosus which itself is seen only in childhood. So what's going on? Let's take a listen to this patient at the apex. Before, the systolic component was slightly louder. Now the diastolic component is slightly louder. This is an example of two murmurs superimposed on one another. Listen again at the upper sternal border. So what pathology is causing this? This is combined aortic stenosis and aortic regurgitation. Once more at the upper sternal border, where the aortic stenosis murmur predominates, 
and at the apex, where the aortic regurgitation murmur predominates. I'm going to talk briefly about what the evidence is for using heart murmurs to make diagnoses. Despite all of my preceding discussion, description of heart murmurs may still seem highly subjective and difficult. It may lead you to wonder how useful a skill it actually is. Here is a chart borrowed from Steve McGee's excellent textbook, Evidence-Based Physical Diagnosis. Here McGee has compiled various studies looking at the sensitivities and specificities of what clinicians identified as a, quote, characteristic murmur. As one should expect, these numbers vary based on the severity of underlying valvular disease. For example, the murmur of mitral regurgitation is 56-75% to 75 sensitive when detecting echocardiographic mitral regurgitation of any severity, but increases to a sensitivity of 84-93% to 93% when detecting either moderate or severe disease. Overall, these numbers compare pretty favorably to the test characteristics of other parts of the physical exam. There are two notable exceptions. First, regarding tricuspid regurgitation. The presence of the characteristic murmur has only a 23% sensitivity. This translates into this murmur being uncommonly heard, despite TR's relative commonality. Luckily, mild TR is rarely of any clinical significance. The second exception is an even lower sensitivity for detecting pul pulmonary regurgitation. For a variety of reasons, this murmur is very rarely heard. Now, I mentioned earlier a joke that uh, grading the intensity of murmurs is sometimes based on how experienced an examiner needs to be in order to hear it. This has actually been studied. In 2006, a group administered a computer-based test to 860 clinicians at all stages of training, which measured competency in hearing and identifying abnormal heart sounds and murmurs, along with abnormal venous and arterial pulsations. So what did they find? First, as you might guess, the worst scoring group were pre-clinical medical students. Second, the best scoring group were cardiology fellows. Also not a surprise. What was surprising, however, is that the scores of clinical medical students, interns, residents, and the senior level faculty were not statistically different from one another. That's right, as a group, third year medical students were just as competent at identifying the presence of abnormal heart sounds and murmurs as cardiologists. It should be noted that the study did not address whether or not there was differences in the clinician's abilities to use the exam data to make appropriate diagnostic and therapeutic decisions. The authors of this study concluded, cardiac examination skills do not improve after the third year of medical school and may decline after years in practice, which has important implications for medical decision making, patient safety, cost-effective care, and continuing medical education. The bottom line is that you, if you are a medical student or a resident or a nursing student, and you think you hear a heart murmur, which your, the senior clinician does not appreciate, don't necessarily assume that you are wrong and the senior clinician is right. The opposite scenario may be equally likely. So if you're still with me at this point and have made it this far, I'm going to assume you have a decent amount of interest in the cardiac exam. Therefore, I will reward you with a little cardiology trivia here, which may score some extra points on rounds. There are a number of specific heart murmurs that have been named after the clinicians who first described them. I'll go through five of these here. First, a mid to late apical diastolic rumble heard in aortic regurgitation, which can mimic mitral stenosis. That is the Austin Flint murmur. Next, the phenomenon in which the highest frequency components of an aortic stenosis murmur radiate to the apex, mimicking mitral regurgitation. That is the Galavardin phenomenon. A murmur of pulmonary regurgitation occurring in the setting of pulmonary hypertension. The Graham-Steele murmur. A mid-diastolic 
murmur heard at the apex during acute rheumatic fever, Carrie Coombs murmur, and lastly, a diastolic murmur heard in stenosis of the left anterior descending artery. That's Doc's murmur. I will leave you with one final point of trivia, the Austin Flint murmur, Graham's Steele murmur, and the Carrie Coombs murmur are, as far as I know, the only eponymous physical findings in the body which contain the physician discoverer's first and the last names. I hope you have found this lecture on heart murmurs both informative and useful. Please remember to like or share the video, uh, or leave a comment if you have a question or feedback. If you haven't already discovered it, you may also enjoy my companion video on heart sounds.